The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Grid Gain Systems webinar, Relational DBMS with Apache Ignite, Faster Transaction and Analytics. I am Nicole Van Gelure and will be today's moderator. Before starting, I will need to conduct a little housekeeping. Can you raise your hand with hand icon on the left of your screen if you can hear me? I don't see any show of hands. Can everybody hear me okay? Hmm. Right, I'm going to assume that you can all hear me as I see no hands. So we're going to carry on with the webinar. On behalf of today's webinar presenter, thanks for joining us. I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Akmal Chandri is a technology evangelist at Grid Gain. His focus is on Apache Ignite and the Apache community. If at any point during the webinar you have a question, please type it in the Q&A panel. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Please also note that your phones will be muted throughout the presentation. You've joined us today to hear about relational DBMS with Apache Ignite, faster transaction and analytics. At the end of the webinar, we'll close out by taking your questions. With that, I'd like to now turn things over to our product expert, Akmal Chandre. Okay, well, thank you very much, Nicole. And um, I, I, it's a little worrying that no one is showing hands that they can hear me. So I hope I'm not going to present this to an empty audience. But uh, there we go. Um, hopefully, the technology is there. working. I see some. We're okay now, now Nicole? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. That's, that's great to know. So uh, I, I have done presentations in the past where I think we've had very few people, but I, I, I don't think I've done any with zero attendance. So um, anyway, it's great great to see that uh, people are uh, actually able to hear and see, then that's fantastic. All right, well, um, thank you very much for uh, joining. And um, again, I extend my appreciation uh, to all of you. Uh, I know we're in that time of year where things to tend to get very quiet and uh, you know it's time to think of uh, vacation and season and holidays and these kind of things and uh, um, I, I'm, I'm in the same same boat so I understand. Um, so we'll keep this uh, reasonably uh, clear. I, I'll try to give you back a little bit of your time if I can but uh, the slide deck is not actually very, very long. Um, it's more the demo which I want to show you a little bit later on which I think is important. Um, anyway, so uh, Apache Ignite, okay, so in-memory performance, durability of disk, and we'll talk about uh, some of these uh, capabilities a little bit later on, what we mean by this. And so if we look at the um, uh, focus for today then, specifically relational database systems with Apache Ignite, faster transactions and analytics, as Nicole mentioned the title a little bit earlier on. So the idea is to show how, how we can use Ignite with existing technology. Um, this is important because often in real-world deployments and real-world scenarios, um, it is the case that we have some existing database technology, typically relational, transactional-based uh, systems. Uh, these systems have value, okay? They have data, they, they have content that we, we need to be able to uh, analyze this data. Um, now, existing tools, BI tools, um, anything that can work with SQL can connect to these uh, technologies well, and we can run some type of, uh, you know, build dashboards, for example, or run some analytics, that's okay. The thing is, sometimes we need to scale beyond uh, a single server. Um, we, we may need a boost in terms of performance, okay? And this is what we're really talking about in terms of this presentation today, is how can we do that? And how can Apache Ignite help you to achieve that? Uh, and this is a common use case, actually, that we see with uh, Ignite and Grid Gain as well. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. So in terms of the agenda, then, as I said, fairly straightforward. So as we'll talk a little bit about the SQL capabilities. So Ignite supports SQL, and uh, it's uh, SQL 99. And we'll give you some examples of the DDL, DML, and uh, subsequently we'll show you some uh, SQL code that's running as well. Uh, caching from a third-party storage, this is the, the key point that I mentioned just uh, a few moments ago. So the ability to work with existing database systems using the power of cluster computing, be able to cache data 
uh, in memory um, in your cluster, run things at memory speeds, but also have the ability, if you want, to persist that data. So then Ignite can also act as a system of record if you want it to you know, use it in that mode. And there are customers out there actually doing that kind of thing as well. Because the key thing is that when you are just caching things in memory, uh, the issue there is that if for some reason you have some catastrophic fa fa failure of your cluster, let's say, uh, you know, massive power outage or uh, some uh, act of nature, act of God, something like this, then your cluster is lost. You, you know, anything that you had in memory is going to be lost. You're going to have to rebuild that data. And that loading process may take time. If uh, you can uh, persist that data now, uh, bringing that cluster up can be much, much faster. And uh, therefore, if you have got very stringent SLAs, <coughs> excuse me, and that's something that's very useful. You can bring the data up. You can have your operational system up and running again very quickly. So that, that's a key sort of point that we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so uh, Ignite as a memory-centric database, okay, so historically, again, this is where Ignite has come from uh, as an in-memory data grid, the ability to really use the, the power of uh, caching and, and cluster computing memory uh, to speed up a lot of uh, uh, operations. And this is something, again, that you can utilize in terms of performing analytics, for example, or machine learning, uh, these kind of modern requirements that uh, uh, we see today. All right. so. Uh, just show you the big picture here, grid gain in memory computing platform, okay? Now, the reason it's called grid gain here is because on the right-hand side, you can see these four light blue uh, vertical bars. Uh, those are enterprise features. Uh, everything you see to the left of those uh, that's in sort of black and red and, and white text, that is free, that is open source, that is Ignite. And uh, I will just very, very briefly mention these uh, sort of four vertical uh, bars that we have on the right hand side, but that's not going to be our focus today. So everything else that we discussed today is going to be free, it's going to be open source. So sometimes the requirements are beyond just the what the open source technology can offer. And Gridgain has a number of enterprise features and services that they provide. And as you can see, we've got data snapshots and recovery, monitoring and management, security and auditing, and data center replication. And so these are paid for features uh, that if you are working and deploying large scale sort of clusters, if you like, or you need some additional capabilities beyond just what the open source offers, then you're, you're very welcome to uh, talk to Gridgain and they will provide expertise and help in this, in this space. Um, and that's all I'll say on that for the moment, okay? By all means, reach out and talk to us if, if you're interested in those. But as I said before, uh, everything else we focus on today will be open source. So looking at the left-hand side then, um, starting in the middle there, we've got this memory-centric storage. So I kind of alluded to this a little bit uh, earlier, a few moments ago, talking about this kind of in-memory data grid, uh, which is a class of technology that was really designed to solve two problems, scale and performance. Okay, so the scale comes from the fact that it is cluster computing, okay, and we can elastically scale up and down as we need, okay, add more nodes uh, to our cluster if we need more processing power or we need uh, more storage, um, and we can remove those uh, subsequently as well when we don't have that uh, kind of uh, demand. And here, if you think about uh, how this might work in reality, well, think about, uh, you know, some of the holiday seasons that we have around the world, like Chinese New Year, for example, or Christmas time. Um, and then typically retailers, uh, businesses see a peak in demand when we all go online, we want to do lots of shopping. Um, and at those periods of time, we need the additional processing power and the capability to handle that demand. And therefore, the ability to scale elastically uh, is going to be a real benefit in that case. Subsequently, when this time has passed, then we, we, we really don't need all that additional capability. And so we can elastically scale down as well and remove some of those additional resources that we don't need to use, that we don't need to pay for. So this is really a, a benefit for us. The other thing in terms of performance then comes from the fact that uh, historically, then uh, these in-memory data grids, precisely in-memory, is the ability to keep data in memory and uh, distribute it across our cluster, and then we can process this data at memory speeds, okay? I mean, that's, again, a real benefit. And there's some other things that we can do as well in terms of co-locating data, which we'll talk about uh, in a few moments' time. Um, down at the bottom, uh, you can see where it says third-party persistence, so RDBMS, HDFS, NoSQL, and this will be a little bit of our focus later on, where I'll show you a demo. 
So the idea here is that, again, say you've got some kind of transactional uh, database system, typically relational, although some NoSQL products are, are transactional as well now. But let's focus specifically on relational. Okay? So it could be MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, DB2, um, SQL Server, for example. And uh, there is an ability then for Ignite to work with that existing technology. So the idea is no rip and replace. And you'll see this message being um, um, you know, often appearing in the literature and uh, discussions centering around Ignite. So what you can do then is to take um, schema information from that existing relational system. Ignite can happily connect to that system then, and then it can cache data from that relational system in memory. Um, and subsequently, we can, you know, it's cluster computing. We can do analytics on that data. We can modify that data. And the nice thing is that Ignite keeps that data in memory plus the backend system in sync. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later on. So very useful in certain circumstances. Again, okay? the ability to offload some of that processing from your so kind of, kind of uh, uh, you know, central C uh, SQL type uh, uh, relational server, and then be able to process that in memory, make some updates, and push those changes back to the relational system. Um, now, in case you're wondering, what happens if you change data within the relational system? Will Ignite become aware of that? Uh, unfortunately not. Okay, so in that case, you need a third-party solution. Uh, there are some products on the market. But one possible, possible way to do this is uh, to use Kafka, for example. And I'll point you to um, uh, some articles that I did recently, which don't uh, cover this uh, specifically, but uh, I'll show you the kind of the general gist of how we could do this, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll get onto that a little bit later. Um, down at the bottom left-hand side, you can see this thing so called Ignite Native Persistence. So now, <coughs> Excuse me. You have the ability to uh, use Ignite as a system of record. Uh, so no longer is it just a sort of a, you know running thing in, in memory, but you can store state and data. And each node in your cluster stores some small part of the database. Um, it's got its own sort of logging capabilities, partition files, and so on. And we'll briefly look at that a little bit later on. So this is useful in those scenarios where, for example, you've got huge amounts of data that don't fit in memory, but will certainly fit on uh, um, some time of storage mechanism, you know, flash, SSD, uh, and so on. And Ignite can then page that data into memory as well and then be able to process that. And then for you as a developer, it's transparent. Okay? You know, it, that's the way that relational systems and other type of database systems work. You know, you, you just direct your queries to the system, it will go away and find the best way to answer that and, and be able to do all the underlying operations that it needs to satisfy that query. So that's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so quickly then along the top then of the memory-centric storage, then starting from the left-hand side, we'll cover a couple of these, uh, but in the interest of time, we won't have the opportunity to do all of them. So SQL. So <clears throat> whether you like it or you don't like it, I mean, the fact of the matter is that SQL today is intergalactic data streams. Okay? It is very, very widely used. If you want to use a lot of BI tools, for example, um, or you need to find skilled developers, it's very easy to do that. <clears throat> Ignite has always had some level of uh, SQL support, but last year in particular, there was a, a considerable effort put in, and again, with the latest release of 2.7, again, more efforts uh, on this uh, for providing sort of uh, full SQL support, DDL, DML, and so on, and um, the, it, it's uh, SQL 99 compliant, okay? So that's very, very useful, and we'll see some examples of some SQL queries uh, very shortly. Uh, key value store. So historically, again, where Ignite has come from is uh, as a key value store. Um, and this is why sometimes you see it referred to as multimodal, okay? Because it can do relational type operations with SQL, relational representation of data, or we can work at it at sort of the key value level as well. Uh, There's a different way of looking at the, at the data. And so the value can be anything, okay? It could be complex types, simple types, anything that you want to define. So, you know, could be a financial instrument, for example or maybe a healthcare record, something like that, okay? It's entirely up to you. Transactions, so Ignite will do transactions, very useful. And part of the reason of the popularity of this technology in the real world, and, and particularly in the financial world, you know, half the use cases of this come from the financial world, is the notion of moving your system from one consistent state to another consistent state. So Ignite will do uh, the ACID type of transactions, 
and it will do the optimistic lock-free transaction. So there are scenarios where we want, may want to use one and scenarios where we want to use the other one. Um, and let me give you a, an example from personal experience. And those of you who are kind of regular attendees will know that I've mentioned this example before, but it's worth um, saying it again. So uh, I, I'm a big fan of MOOCs, massive open online courses. And so earlier this year, I was on the website for a particular merchant, there's a particular course that I wanted to take and I wanted to pay for it to get the certificate. And I got my credit card out, I put the details in, I hit the pay button and uh, it came back and said, there is an error. Now, I didn't think too much of it because I thought, okay, the transaction has failed, doesn't matter, okay, you know, it's not gone through. A little while later, <clears throat> I checked on my credit card statement and I noticed that I've actually been billed. And so I go to the merchant and uh, inquired about this and they said, you know, we haven't received the money. And then I went to the bank and said, uh, and they said, uh, uh, you've paid for this. Okay, so the issue is then where's the money? You know, this uh, kind of situation should not happen. If I want to transfer money from my bank account, your bank account. My account needs to be correctly debited. Your account needs to be correctly credited. Okay? It's an atomic unit of work. Either all of it happens or none of it happens. So Ignite will guarantee these type of ACID transactions, you know, these units of work that uh, all the operations take place or none of them take place. That ensures that our system remains consistent. Very, very important. Okay. Uh, compute and services will skip for today. We don't, uh, unfortunately, need lack of time and uh, this can be the focus of future webinars. Uh, streaming, very useful. So if you are working with existing streaming technologies, you no know, Spark streaming, Flink, Kafka, and so on, again, Ignite will happily integrate with these technologies. Uh, and again, uh, I'll show you a little bit of Kafka, um, not a demo, but just a couple of blog posts that I've written. Again, uh, uh, that problem that I alluded to a little bit earlier on in terms of, you know, if there are changes in the back-end relational system, how could Ignite see those changes? Um, and so the, there is a, a workaround for that using Kafka, for example, as a, as a potential solution. There are other ways you could do this, of course, but that's a kind of a, a one way that we could do it. Um, and again, uh, the last thing there, machine learning. So machine learning was in beta for quite some time from last year. It went GA earlier this year, and those capabilities and uh, features are being enhanced and improved all the time. So again, this idea of being able to run uh, algorithms at scale on cluster computing um, on huge amounts of data to get some insights and analytics and again, I'll show you uh, some uh, uh, code, uh, demo code that comes as part of the distribution a little bit later on. Okay, let's move on. So, <clears throat> in terms of the SQL capabilities then, so it's distributed SQL, okay? So, we have uh, JDBC, SQL API, ODBC mm -hmm. support, and all of the standard things in terms of select, update, insert, merge, delete, create, and alter. And I'll show you some examples of some queries that uh, use some of these capabilities in the demo a little bit later on. Um, now, the thing is, at the top level, Ignite provides support for a number of sort of key language. Now, obviously, it's a Java-based product, uh, but it does on-heap and off-heap, okay? So it has its own memory management system as well. Um, two other languages that it really integrates uh, uh, at sort of the equivalent level, I would say, is .NET and C++ as well. So there is an opportunity if you want, and this is common in many organizations where there may be different, different languages and different frameworks being used by different groups, that you can store data in a common format. And you can access it in Java, you can access it from .NET, you can access it from C++. These are all possible. And then, of course, then we want to be able to plug in, you know, business intelligence and other tools as well to be able to get insights, uh, build our dashboards, run sort of queries, you know, build our pie charts and graphs and all those kind of things. That's fine. Um, the dynamic scaling then we, took, we talked about a little bit earlier on, very useful capability. Uh, indexes in RAM or disk. And again, all of these kind of capabilities to you as a developer, basically, you don't care. I mean, the system will manage all this for you, and that's the important thing. So under the covers, Ignite will handle all of these things uh, for you. Uh, and then just a couple of uh, simple uh, sort of code examples. So I'll show you um, some uh, code running a little bit later on, but this is specifically if you want to start uh, using uh, you know, JDBC, and we have this thing called a thin driver, okay? So uh, if you're familiar with how JDBC works, then this should really not be a uh, anything uh, surprising for you. It's just using the standard format and just using the, the way that we can uh, call JDBC, uh, you know, register the driver, open the connection, all very standard here. Okay. 
Now, the data definition language, uh, remember I mentioned earlier that we have uh, support for SQL 99. Now, if you look at this example on the right-hand side, this create table city, okay? So if you look, we've got all these standard sort of field names and types. A uh, little bit later on, right at the end there, we've got some extension here. Now it says with template equals partitioned, backups equals one, affinity key equals country code. So this is a little bit of sort of extending the syntax of SQL because there's some other things that we, we can give ignite some hints and some information. So there is this notion of co-location, for example. And there you can see this mention of affinity key, okay? So the idea here is that in a distributed environment, what we want to do is to try to keep uh, data that has some relationship with other data, perhaps we can keep that together, we can store it together. And therefore the chances are that if there's some relationship between that data, it makes sense to store it together rather than distribute it across our cluster because chances are when we run queries, we'll probably want to access the, the two bits of data together. And therefore there is a, uh, this notion of storing the data together and if we're going to run SQL joins, for example, then they're gonna be a lot more efficient. And again, we've got a couple of slides coming up that show this principle. Um, uh, in action. Uh, and again, the backups equals one. So for example, again, because we're working in a distributed environment, I think it's good practice that you have at least one backup of your copy. Um, you can create additional backups as well. Okay. And the, the, you know, it depends upon uh, what, what, what is the, the tolerance or the safety that you're willing to, um, uh, to bear, if you like, and uh, what the, the kind of importance of the data to you. And if, you know, some parts of your cluster go down, then having the backup copies can be a, a real boon because then you, you have the ability to continue processing, continue asking queries of your system, uh, even though maybe some parts of your cluster have gone down. So again, uh, we'll have a look at that a little bit later on. Um, so data manipulation language, I mentioned this already, ANSI SQL 9 specification. And here, as you can see, um, I mean, this is a reasonably complex uh, query and we actually use something like this a little bit later on. So we've got a, a join across a couple of tables, as you can see, and the, you know it's the standard select from where, and we're doing some grouping and ordering, and we're limiting the results. And again, there's a notebook uh, I've got which uh, uh, shows a couple of examples of this type of query in action. All right, so this co-located join. So we, we talked about this a few moments ago. Now, the thing is, um, here is an example of a query in the middle. As you can see, we're doing a select from uh, and we're doing a join. And we've got, in this case, uh, two nodes. And uh, as you can see, we've done a little bit of co-location here because we realized that, for example, countries and cities, there's a natural kind of affinity between them. And then probably if we're querying uh, countries and we want to find all cities within, that, within a particular country, for example, then it makes sense to do this kind of co-location in this way. So we've got Canada uh, and its associated cities stored on one Ignite node, and we've got India and its associated cities stored on another Ignite node. And then when we run this query, uh, the query will work over the local data. It will do the joins locally. It doesn't have to... Uh, do that join across the cluster. Now, the thing is that if we don't use co-location, and let's say here is the scenario where, as you can see, the, the, the cities for uh, Canada and India are kind of distributed across the two nodes, there's no affinity information being utilized here. So the query is exactly the same. Um, the query will still work, but now there's gonna be an overhead in terms of some data movement or in terms of uh, having to reach across the different nodes in our cluster to be able to find that data and perform that join operation. And potentially this could be expensive, okay? It could be very expensive. You know, there may be a lot of uh, uh, work that uh, goes on. Now, uh, for the architects and developers, then this is the decision that you have to make, okay? You have to think carefully about the sorts of access patterns that you're gonna have how you want to co-locate that data, make these kind of intelligent decisions, and then Ignite will work well for those. So in those kind of scenarios, you know, it, it, there are some things that you have to think about beforehand, uh, which will help uh, improve the performance of these type of queries significantly. Okay, caching from a third party storage, All right? So this is one of the sort of key, uh, you know, the, if you like, sort of the, the turbocharging of your, of your data, database system, okay? And then we'll, we'll look at uh, uh, this very, very shortly in the, in the demo that I'll show you. So there we have the notion of kind of read-through and write-through. <coughs> Here we're showing key values. 
Um, and our in-memory uh, data grid on the right-hand side in the graphics. So as you can see, we've got a couple of nodes with different sort of values being stored here, but uh, the example that I'll show you is actually working with SQL, okay? So key points here, as mentioned on the left-hand side, database caching use case, okay? Sliding that in between database system and applications, okay? Because then we can utilize this cluster computing, we can utilize this caching, uh, the, it can run these operations much, much faster, and therefore you get your insights into your analytics uh, much faster. And as you know, today it's very important for business um, executives and people to be able to you know, query data, get information out of their system much faster. It's a very competitive world. You know, there's deregulation in many industries. We, 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 we kind of live um, in an age where it's kind of instant gratification. You know, we, we want to get data and information much, much faster. We, business decisions have to be made faster as well. You know, opportunities and threats come up and we need to react to those very quickly. Uh, this no rip and replace performance boost, keep da both data in memory and database systems scale to thousands of nodes. So again, the idea is that you keep your existing investment. There is no need to remove uh, uh, or replace some existing database system if you don't need to, okay? So chances are you have investment, time, money, effort um, in some existing database system. Perhaps it can meet, uh, you know, quite a large, um, number of your requirements already, but in this case, Ignite could help significantly with some additional requirements that you have. And again, maybe some new requirements, business analytics, for example, come in for which the existing system was not designed, but Ignite can help in that case. So you keep your existing investment and then use Ignite to enhance that system, uh, hence this kind of no rip and replace message. Uh, the other thing, the scale to thousands of nodes. So uh, with the support now of Zookeeper, for Ignite, potentially, uh, you know, you can add thousands and thousands of nodes if you really want to. Uh, you could really scale up to a, a huge uh, cluster if necessary. I mean, that, that's the key point there. Uh, automatic read through and write through. Um, I will show you examples of this. Now it says here, key value operations only. And actually, I will show you some SQL code that's running and we'll see uh, how these changes are being reflected in uh, um, a, a live system as well. So. You know, bear with me, we'll get to that demo very shortly. And again, ANSI SQL 99. Um, so the key thing here is that uh, it, it says here over in-memory data sets, but if we look at what we will show you a little bit later on, in fact, yes, uh, the, the queries can be done on the in-memory on the Ignite side, that's absolutely fine, uh, but then those changes are propagated to the back end as well. So I've got uh, my SQL server, for example, and I've got some tables and data and I make some changes in memory and uh, then subsequently we can see those updates being reflected in, in the backend system as well. We'll see that very shortly. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll show you this as well. So the Ignite Web Console. So this is um, console.gridgain.com. If you want to create a free account, you're welcome to do that. That's hosted by Gridgain. Uh, if you would like to download this from the Apache website, uh, you can build it locally and then you can install it locally. So the example that I'll show you is I'm running uh, the console on the grid game website. Uh, if you want to utilize it just for sort of testing purposes or just to get a feel for how it actually works, that's a good idea. Register, create an account, and, and you can play around with that and, and get some sense of how this actually works. Subsequently, obviously, it makes sense that you would typically want to run this behind your firewall internally, and therefore, the best thing to do is just download this from the uh, Apache website, build it locally, and then you can install it locally um, it, you know, behind your firewall so that it's not accessible from outside. And again, I'll show you this a little bit later on. Okay, very quickly then. So Ignite as a memory-centric database. So this is what we talked about a little bit sort of earlier, you know, this kind of durable memory. Um, and there are things that it can do. Now we talked about kind of on heap and uh, off heap. So Ignite can do a lot of things for you. Uh, automatic defragmentation, for example. You also get predictable memory consumption. Um, and Kate, so the fact that it's a Java-based product, uh, so that the, the Java element of it uh, in terms of memory management has been reduced significantly. Ignite manages, uh, it's, it, you know, it's got its own memory management system. And again, because this is open source, you're welcome to download the source code. You know, you have a look at, at how they've actually implemented this if you so wish to do. I mean, that's per perfectly available. Um, Store superset of data. I, I think the superset is not a, a great word to use. So essentially what we're saying there is that on disk, potentially, 
if we want to persist data, you know, we can store all of our data on disk. I mean, that's essentially the, the point that I think it's trying to make there. If we want to use Ignite as a system of record, we can store all of the data on disk, and that's fine. And then subsequently, it, it can page in what it needs into in memory um, and run you know, things at memory speeds if we need. And there's actually a, a kind of a range of options. So we could, for example, use Ignite purely as in memory and no persistence. That's OK. Then historically, it's kind of in memory data grid type role. Or we could use it as a system of record where we're storing everything on disk now and then sort of paging in what we need into, into memory. Or it could be kind of 50-50. You know, we could, uh, we could split uh, it that way. Or we could uh, uh, use it with a third-party system as we're going to do very shortly. So there's a range of uh, uh, use cases and options. Uh, and there's quite a bit of flexibility there, as you can see, in terms of how you can use Ignite. Uh, now. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, we've got fully transactional write-ahead log. So if you're going to use Ignite with its kind of native persistence, uh, this durable memory, as it's called, then uh, obviously now that it's behaving like a, a database system, uh, if there are sort of failures or problems, then we need some information in terms of recovering uh, the, the data as well. And th this write-ahead log, it does not do in-place updates, OK? so the, the the issue there is that they are expensive, okay? So these changes uh, in, in the data are written to a write-ahead log. Subsequently, um, those changes are applied. Uh, the log is shrunk, okay? And then w the data are available again uh, in terms of the sort of query and processing, okay? So the, there's a lot of detail about this. If you're interested in the specific implementation of this, again, I, I can point you to the relevant resources if you want to have a, have a look at how they've actually done this. Now, it says they're instantaneous restarts, okay? So restarts are going to be much, much faster than it just keeping things in memory. Because if our cluster goes down and we're just using the in-memory capabilities, then obviously when we bring our cluster back up again, there's going to be a time period that we need to reconstruct everything in memory. And that can take time. You know, if you've got a lot of data, we need to build up everything in memory again. Now, as I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier on, we mentioned this uh, notion of uh, you know, tight SLAs. If we need to bring our system back up quickly, then using these persistence capabilities, this is kind of durable memory, is going to be much faster. Because now each node has some part of the database. Uh, it's got its own sort of partition files, its own sort of logs. And therefore, when we bring the system up, we can do that much, much faster. Because the data are there. You know, The state and data has been saved. And therefore, there's no, no need to reconstruct uh, everything in memory. Okay, it's very much faster to bring um, uh, everything back up to a live working system. Okay, so <clears throat> this is uh, just a, a quick uh, diagram uh, graphic just to show you how this uh, kind of uh, uh, native persistence capability works. So I, I mentioned this in the previous slide that we've got this kind of write ahead log, okay, which contains information about the changes. And then uh, there's some checkpointing that takes place. Okay, so each node also has these partition files as well. Um, and then as updates are applied, okay, under the covers, it persists, do the checkpointing, and then sends back a message to confirm, you know, that uh, yes, it's it's done. The uh, uh, the changes have been applied. Okay. Um, there's a couple of ways you can enable this kind of native persistence. Uh, so you can do it through this uh, XML configuration file if you like. Or it can be done directly in the code itself. Okay, and I, I think typically if you're going to do it in the code, it's uh, I, from memory. I think it's like one line of code just to enable uh, a flag, and then Ignite knows that yes, the, the data needs to be persisted. Um, and again, through the examples that can be downloaded from the uh, Apache website, uh, there are uh, code examples to show you how to actually do this in Java. Okay, and uh, we'll get to those shortly. All right. So just before we we get to the demo, and we've got a Fair bit of time to still to do that, which is good. Uh, so uh, just to give you some sense in terms of the popularity of this project. So among top five Apache projects, OK, so these are numbers actually from the Apache Software Foundation. So as you can see, Ignite is uh, number one in the uh, top five developer mailing lists. Uh, very active community, lots and lots of uh, um, uh, you know, great people on that list. So if you have a question, it could be the world's simplest question or the world's most complex question. Do not hesitate, please, to sign up, ask on the uh, uh, dev list, and those people, uh, you know, the community is super helpful. They will come in and uh, assist you, help you understand how Ignite works, or if you've got a specific 
question about configuration or sort of a, a, you know use case, then again they'll be able to assist uh, and help you understand whether Ignite is the right technology uh, for for you. Uh, top five user mailing list. Okay, so we are number two, just behind uh, Lucene uh, Solar. And then in terms of overall number of commits, as you can see, there's only three other projects that are ahead, you know, Hadoop, Ambari, and Camel. So again, you know, a very popular high-level project at the Apache Software Foundation. Um, and it says here now over a million downloads per year. I think this number needs to be updated. I believe it's of the order of two million now. Um, so that's, again, worth keeping in mind. There are lots and lots of downloads. So Plenty of people are downloading the free open source version of this technology uh, and are using it in production systems. Um, uh, but as I briefly mentioned a little bit earlier on, there are some enterprise capabilities that you may need beyond what just the open source offers. And therefore, please, you know, you're, you're welcome to contact Gridgain uh, and we will assist you to help you um, decide you know, if, if those capabilities are appropriate for you. And if they are, then obviously there's some, uh, in terms of licensing fees and other issues uh, surrounding that. Those are paid for services. All right, so let me stop there then uh, end the show. Okay, so I've only got one more slide, which I think is that one, which we'll come back to in just a moment. So now uh, let me just show you uh, a little bit of a demo. Okay, so the first thing to note here is that as you can see here, and let me uh, see if I can blow this up a little bit for you just to show you. Okay, so I've got a uh, MySQL um, database server, and I started this a little bit earlier on. Okay, so that's uh, up and running. Okay, and I'm using this uh, community version of dBeaver, and it's uh, happily connected to this uh, uh, MySQL database. So let's have a look. Okay, so we've got this um, database called World, and it's got a couple of tables. Okay, so city, country, country language. And here, I'm just looking at one of these uh, uh, tables, uh, which, um, as you can see, we've got uh, some, some country codes here. And this particular row here, 224, that I'm looking at, it's uh, USA. And as you can see here, its name is United States. It's in North America, uh, and so on. And, and, and if we scroll to the right here, as you can see, there's quite a lot of fields here. So the overall size of this particular database is not very large, but it's useful in terms of uh, what we would like to try and show today. All right. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, so what Ignite can do is once we have um, a database server running, in this case, MySQL, uh, I've used Ignite, <coughs> excuse me, to connect to this uh, database server, I pulled schema information from it. Uh, Ignite has automatically generated a project for me, which is I'm now running within this IDE, and uh, uh, I've got uh, it, it's taken care of all the plumbing, all of the infrastructure that I need to talk to that system, and it's generated some code for me as well. So one of the bits of code is this uh, server node startup. So now I've actually got a, an Ignite um, uh, server node up and running inside my IDE, IDE here. Now, it's not doing anything, just waiting for connections. It's just sitting there. Uh, another thing that we, we have and which Ignite generates for you is this load caches. So what it will do is it will connect to this MySQL system in this case. It will pull the information from those tables out. It will cache it in um, this uh, uh, server node that we've got, and we'll have a look at that in, in just a moment. Okay, so let's actually do that now. Okay, so let me run this. Okay, and there we go. It's going to hopefully be reasonably fast. Let me just zoom in a bit here. Okay, so there we go. There we go. So there we go. So that was fairly fast. As I said before, the database is not particularly large, but it's great for just some illustrative purposes, just to show you how this thing works. So it says loading caches. So it's done all of the three tables. We could have selected to not do all three tables. We could have picked one, for example, or two. Uh, but in this case, I was interested to get the entire database. Uh, and therefore, I'm, I would like to get all of the data from that MySQL server and load it into my Ignite cluster, which in this case is just one server uh, running at the moment, which is fine. All right, now, the web console we talked about, okay? So as you can see here, um, if you're sharp-eyed and, and you can see the address at the top there, it's uh, console.gridgain.com, okay? 
and I'm running this um, uh, notebook which has got some uh, SQL queries that uh, we can execute upon that cache data. Uh, and one of the other things that we can do, so we can have a look at this monitoring dashboard, and this gives us some information about what's actually running. So there, this is a, a cluster of just one server at the moment, so they're, they're not uh, very useful information or statistics right now, but uh, if we scroll down a little bit and then just have a look at what's actually uh, uh, created for us. And let me just uh, blow this up a bit here, for example. Uh, as you can see, and let me try and zoom in a little bit here. OK, so we can see here we've got city, country, country language. And uh, it's just appended cache on there. We could change that name if we wanted to. And if we scroll to the right here, as you can see, uh, we've got uh, the total amount of data here. In this case, we've opted not to create any backups. So as you can see, backups is zero for each of these. Uh, so th there's a primary. And uh, as you can see, the, the number of data, um, this is off heap, OK? So remember, we talked about on heap and off heap. So this is off heap uh, in this case. So it's a small data set, but useful for uh, our purposes. All right, now let's go back and go back to our queries. Uh, which was the MyGnite cluster, OK? And what we can do then is let's try and run a particular query here, OK? So in this uh, first query that we have, uh, let me just scroll up. Yep, there we go. We can just zoom in a little bit and have a look at there, OK? So this is name, max population, um, and group by name, uh, order by max pop limit it to three in descending order. If we execute this and have a look at the results, here we go. Now, the, the data are a little bit old, but that's fine. I mean, so we're here we can see that China is the most uh, populous country uh, here, followed by India, followed by the United States. That's OK. OK, so we get some immediate results back. And now, this is actually querying the Ignite cache, OK? We are not hitting the backend uh, uh, MySQL system yet. Subsequently, let's go down a little bit further then. And uh, let's now uh, run something, OK, where we are going to actually perform an update operation. So this is going to take the country table. And where we've got the USA, we're going to set the name to United States. Now, I, I showed you that a few moments ago uh, using db ver, OK? So if I execute this, OK, it just uh, gives us a 1 to tell us it was successful, OK? That's fine. Let's minimize this and then switch back to db ver and have a look. OK, so this is the row we we're talking about. Now I need to go here and uh, refresh this view. So if we do that, as you can see, the United States has now been changed to USA, OK? so. Not only are the data updated in Ignite's cache, but that update has been propagated to our backend uh, relational system as well. And if we want to change that value back, we can do that with this uh, next query, where actually we're saying, take the name United States, change it back to USA. Okay, So if we execute this, and again, it gives us a 1, shows us successful. And then again, back here, we can refresh this. And there you see that now it's changed back to the United States again. OK, so the, 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 this is the sort of practical upshot of using Ignite in this mode, that the, the data in memory are updated as well. And Ignite takes care of the, uh, the backend system. It keeps the two in sync for us uh, automatically. And again, uh, you know, any other type of uh, SQL queries that we want to run. So at the bottom here, here we've got a sort of simple select statement where we're simply doing a search uh, uh, across the city table and name equals London. Uh, this is perfectly fine as well. And in this case, it happens to have found uh, London, England, and London, Ontario as well, and given us some information in terms of the population. OK, so let me mi minimize this then. All right. OK, so uh, as you can see, very, very straightforward, uh, fairly easy to implement. Now, uh, let me just switch back here and show you the detail. So th there's a lot of kind of detail which I skipped over. But if you were to check the Apache website, so this is ignite.apache.org. In the top right-hand corner, we've got this thing called screencasts. And if we click on this, 
and scroll down to the bottom here. Okay, so my colleague uh, Prachi at uh, Gridgain put together these uh, three screencasts. <coughs> Excuse me, about ten minutes of your time. Okay, they're about three, three, four minutes uh, long, um, each of them. And so this actually walks you through step by step to show you how Ignite can be used to connect to an external um, transactional. In this case, it's MySQL. She uses the same example um, database system. Um, how we can decide, you know. Ignite will show us the schema that's available for a particular database, uh, and then we can choose which tables that we would like. And then again, once we are ready, it can generate the project for us. So again, it takes care of all the plumbing, all the in infrastructure. Um, that project can be downloaded. Uh, we unpack it. We can read it into an IDE, as I as I did um, for the example that I showed you. And then the only thing we need to plug in are credentials. Okay, so username, password, uh, the IP address, and the port number uh, where it's running. And then we're good to go. That's all we need to do. And then we can fire up a, a node directly from the IDE, as you saw that I did. I had one running earlier. And then we can load the caches. And then once the caches are loaded, as you can see from the uh, web console, the um, uh, console.gridgain.com, I was able to uh, look at the status so I can see the fact that these caches have been created in the monitoring tool. And again, from the uh, notebook, there's some SQL queries be prepared that I had, which again uh, showed you some examples of just being able to run some uh, standard type of queries. So standard SQL, okay? And we did some updates. Those updates and changes were propagated back to the uh, MySQL database. So very, very straightforward and e easy to use. Um, again, could be a significant time saver, okay? So Ignite takes care of all the plumbing, all the hard work for us, and then we as developers simply uh, uh, can work with the uh, with the generated code, and we can use it to load our cache and uh, be able to perform these operations. All right, so a, a couple of other things that uh, I'd like to uh, show you then, and let me just uh, skip back and go here. So here, if I... Um, close this. Uh, uh, actually, let me try and uh, open a new project. Rather than we'll, we'll keep that one running, and we'll open this in a new window. Okay, so this is um, uh, version two point six of uh, Ignite. So as I said before, version two point seven. If you check the uh, Apache website, that's the latest version with some si significant improvements in terms of the SQL support, MVCC support, and, and many other sort of enhancements and features. And in particular, if you're interested in the machine learning, for example, I, I believe the TensorFlow support uh, is there as well if you're interested in deep learning. So the examples that come with this, so this is the um, binary distribution. And all I've done is just read in the pom.xml file into my IDE. And on the left-hand side, as you can see, uh, all of these examples are available for me to use. And if we look carefully, we can see, for example, persistent store. So we've got some code that shows us how to use how to utilize that. Uh, we've got the machine learning here as well, for example. And we've got, and again, that has been enhanced significantly from this particular version. So there's things like genetic algorithms, for example. So the key thing here is that um, all of these examples will work standalone. You do not need a cluster. Uh, or a large cluster to run them. Uh, you can actually create a cluster within the IDE itself. Here we've got, for example, example node startup. But we can start up a node, and we can actually start up a couple of them within the IDE itself. We can run these examples directly, the code examples directly from the IDE. Um, so you know, if you want to get sort of some idea, some uh, hands-on with the code, that's a, a great way to do it. And certainly, as far as the analytics is concerned, as, it, as we've discussed through the presentation, okay, so there's a range of uh, capabilities that you can use. So the SQL is a great one, um, often used for doing uh, uh, you know, these type of notebook-based queries, which you saw me doing. But again, this could be done through code as well. And we can plug in uh, uh, BI tools as well. You know, anything that understands uh, JDBC, ODBC will be fine. And then subsequently, if there's additional uh, capabilities that we need. For example, let's say we've got lots of data cached in memory. So in my uh, example that I showed with uh, taking that data from MySQL, caching it in memory, uh, yep, I showed you the SQL. But that, let's say now I wanted to do some machine learning on that, or I wanted to do some additional analytics on that. 
remember the data are now available. It's, it, it's stored by Ignite. It's in memory. I can run some code either through Java, for example, or I could do it, uh, uh, you know, some third party tool, for example. I, I can now interrogate that data. I could do some machine learning. Uh, I can get some insights on that data. I, I, and some good examples of this, I think, uh, are available in the documentation to show what other sort of capabilities and things you could do. So performance can be boosted significantly, again, because we're utilizing the power of the cluster and we can scale up and down as we need to. That gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, and the thing is that with Ignite, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. Okay? The, the, the nodes are equal um, and there is no special node. There's no special configuration that we need to do. Um, and even within an IDE, if you're, if you're new to this technology, you can get up and running within five minutes. I mean, just need an IDE, you just need Java, and you can download uh, the, the, the binary distribution from the uh, Apache website, or if you'd like to build from source, you can do that as well. And something like the console, again, if, you, if you'd like to just test it out, you can try it from the console.gridgame.com to give you the opportunity <coughs> to run some SQL queries, you know, look at how analytics might work from that perspective, or you can download that, build that locally, uh, and then host that behind your firewall if you'd like to build a cluster internally within your organization. Okay, so uh, I'm conscious of time and uh, I'm try and leave a few minutes for some discussion. So I think we are at about 10.50 or no, and I think that pretty much wraps it up. And let me just uh, switch back to my slide deck. So as I said before, happy to put this one up now. So we've got a couple of minutes then uh, for questions. So I'm very happy to try and do my best to answer them. Um, all I would say is that uh, subsequently Nicole will um, push the uh, slide deck and the video recording and you'll be able to access those a little bit later on. But if you'd like to get in touch with me, it's just my first name dot last name at gridgain.com. So it's just akmal.chaudhry at gridgain.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm also on Twitter. So you're, you're welcome to reach out and connect uh, from that way. Um, and again, if there's any sort of serious technical questions that you have uh, that I'm unable to answer, or you'd just like to, to, to kind of understand the technology a little bit better, then by all means, please, I encourage you to uh, sign up to the uh, dev list and the user list, uh, you know, awesome community. They will be able to assist you. And, and don't be afraid. You know, it could be, the world, as I said before, the world's simplest question or it could be the world's most complex question. Just ask, okay? And the community will, will assist and help you. And it's important, again, because uh, we want to help you to use Ignite um, for the kind of problems for we, which is going to be good for. Uh, and, and that's important for us as a community as well. And again, important for you to, to ensure that you are using the right tool for the right job. OK, Nicole, so I'll hand it back to you. And then if we've got any questions, I'll do my very best to answer them uh, today. If not, uh, I'm sure we can follow up uh, and, and take care of those later. Thank you, Akmal. We'd like to give you the opportunity, as Akmal mentioned, to ask your questions to him. I have <coughs> a question in the Q&A panel now. I'll just check if we have some questions. Um, yes, we have some questions. So I'll just um, have a look at those. Can we have three different tables in an Ignite cluster, each of which persists to different party persistent stores? Uh, let me try and understand. So three different tables. Um, yeah, could, there is table yeah, one could you repeat that? to Oracle DB, table two persists to HDFS, table three persists to App. MySQL DB. Ah, okay, gotcha, gotcha. I understand. So the idea there is that what you want to use is multiple database systems, and then you want to. Uh, so the the example I gave was I was connecting to a single database server and then taking the schema information from that single database server. But I think what's being asked here is that what happens if you're running three different database systems? Could you use Ignite? In that? That's a very interesting question. Uh, to be honest with you, off the top of my head, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had anyone ask me that question before. It's something I will go away and find out. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a, 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 an adequate answer for you, but it's a very interesting problem. And I can see where that kind of question comes from, because today I think 
you know, in some organizations, multiple database systems being used, data warehouses, and so on, and therefore there may be a need to sort of pull information from different uh, systems, and then perhaps you want to run operations across these uh, different tables, and uh, maybe even you know you want to merge or join data across these tables. I, uh, that's a great question, and, and, and I apologize, I don't know the answer. Uh, I will go away and find out, and, and we'll be happy to follow up on that one. Fabulous question. Thank you very much to whoever asked that one, though. Another question is, can we have all databases in my SQL instance connected to Ignite? All databases? Uh, I think what Ignite does, it's on a per database um, case. So it, it will generate the plumbing and infrastructure on a per database case. Uh, so if, for example, I mean, the, I showed the world, that, and I can pull up uh, dBeaver here, for example. So here we are looking at just the world database um, as the uh, example we were using. But I, I'm assuming what the uh, question is suggesting is that if we've got other databases within MySQL as well, would it be able to do all of those? Uh, if you... I think you can't do it in a single way, uh, if, if I can put it that way. It, it has to be on a per database basis. I think the reason for that is that Ignite has to know what you are connecting to. And in, in terms of ensuring that it syncs correctly with each particular set of tables, for example, uh, or databases, that, that it, it has to do it on a, uh, on a per database basis. But again, fabulous question. Uh, and I don't think anyone's asked this before. OK, so again, I will make a note of this. But my understanding is that it, it's, say I've got uh, this database here called employees, and then another one here called world. Would it be able to take it uh, and generate the code in one kind of instance from both of them? I don't think you can do it that way. It has to know which database you want to for it to manage, and then it generates the plumbing according to that particular database. Uh, so there are particular, for example, I might decide in the case of the world database that I only want to manage one table. And then in the case of the employee database, for example, I might decide that I only wanted to manage departments. Um, I, I can do that on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think I, I, I'm not aware of it being able to do it in one go, if I can put it that way. I, I don't think that's possible. But again, I, I would double check. Again, fabulous question. Thank you very much for whoever asked that question as well. Great question. Uh, and again, need, needs a bit more insight from me. We have another very good question here, Akmal. We have a use case for SQL-based read-through from HDFS. Is it possible right. through GGFS or IGFS? If so, how do we accomplish that? Oh, yes, good one. Um, IGFS is the Ignite uh, in-memory file system. And if I look back at the slide deck, let me go back to, uh, where was it now? Here, this one. So it mentions here HDFS and NoSQL, if we look at the third-party persistence uh, graphic in, in the bottom, um, so it says RDBMS, HDFS, NoSQL. IGFS, I believe, is still supported. Um, how much support is available, I don't know. It's, it's not something I come across very often. I, I, I believe that's possible. Yes, it should be, you know, certainly HDFS is supported. And I, IGFS is just a, a replacement for HDFS, but in memory. So essentially, what you're doing is the, is the ability to read and write to a kind of an in-memory, if you like, file system, and so that should be that should work without uh, issues. But I don't know of many users uh, uh, of that approach today. Uh, a lot of them tend to be in this space here, where it's typically relational, transactional type systems. Increasingly, as you know, some of these NoSQL products are offering this capability as well. So there are a number of products, you know, MongoDB version four, for example, uh, MarkLogic. Uh, even I think uh, um, Amazon have announced that the DynamoDB, the latest version, will do some transaction operations. All of those kinds of things I think will be well supported. So uh, yes, definitely IGFS, I think it yep, shouldn't be any issue, but I haven't come across any use cases personally. Again, we can drill down and, and try to find some examples of this. The documentation I think is there, um, but it's not something that I, I come across uh, at all. So Great question again, thank you. We have time for one more question, I think. Um, are updates at MySQL automatically populated in Ignite? Uh, no. 
So if the changes are done in Ignite, and thank you very much to whoever asked that question. I really appreciate that because I did mention right at the very start that I would show you something uh, related to Kafka. So uh, this is the um, Ignite uh, blog site. And as you can see, there it's me. Uh, and if you have a look, the last two bits of content that I've done, actually something that, that was published just yesterday, which is running in the cloud, uh, but the the previous one on the November 26 was uh, using grid gain with Kafka connector. So if I show you the graphic, so the idea here is the architecturally it looks something like this. As you can see, we've got this notion of sources and we've got sinks. And in this particular case, we've got grid gain as a source, but grid gain can also act as a sink and potentially any Kafka enabled data source on the left hand side, any Kafka enabled data sink on the right hand side. So the example that I, I write in this article shows grid gain as the source, but MySQL uh, or a relational system as the sink. There, you can do it the other way around. You can switch it the other way around. So for example, the relational system can be the source and grid gain can be the sink. And in this case, using Kafka in this uh, way uh, kind of solves that problem of uh, updates being done within the relational system because then they can be seen by grid gain. Uh, it, it, you know, those changes will be uh, uh, propagated and seen by grid gain, or you know, that will work. This is a solution to that problem. Uh, typically, for that type of scenario, though, generally you need some kind of third-party um, solution, uh, and uh, you know. I don't want to name drop, but something like Oracle Golden Gate, for example, is typically is a typical sort of uh, technology that's used for that kind of scenario. So Ignite will work great to take the data and schema information from an existing system, cache it. The data in memory operations updates will be pushed back to uh, the the backend system. In in the case of our example, we we use MySQL. As you saw, that worked great. Now, if I've got some third-party application that comes in and does updates to those tables uh, in MySQL, which Ignite doesn't know about, unfortunately, Ignite doesn't know about that, you, if you see what I mean. It, there, there, we need another way to tell Ignite that the data have changed. And uh, Kafka, for example, is one way we could do it. And there are other third-party solutions on the market. Oracle Golden Gate comes to mind uh, is another solution to this. Uh, that's the way it is at the moment, unfortunately. Um, it, it's simply the case that Ignite is happily able to cache the data, but it can't see the updates if those changes are done through some other application on the database server side. Thank you, Akmal. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Might I ask for those that still have questions because we have a good number of questions still outstanding. Maybe you'd like to send an email to akmal.chandri at gridgain.com to get your answers. It might be the easiest way, the easiest thing to do. And in the meantime, I'd like to thank um, Akmal for talking today. And thanks to each of you for joining us and your participation. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Uh, yes, and, and I guess, Nicole, we, we, we wish everyone seasonal greetings and happy holidays. And again, thank you for your time for joining us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.